Hi, I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. Welcome to The Lauren Epstein Show. You're listening to 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia, where we talk about jobs and careers. Today, we are going to be talking about employment branding and what that means. And I've got a couple of amazing, alive, energetic experts uh, that we're going to be hearing from. But I want you to think about what it was that had you take the job that you have now. Was it it was the only job that you had available, or was it the office, the culture, uh, what they do, um, the salary? And I want you to think about that because fundamentally companies are now, and not just right now, but for the last maybe 10 or 15 years, focusing on the culture and the branding and how they show up in the world. That us as, as folks see these companies and uh, want to work for them or don't want to work for them. I think now it's safe to say a lot of people probably don't want to work for Uber. You know, maybe that's changing, but the the CEO got a really bad reputation. And a lot of people may want to work for Facebook or Google because they hear about free meals and high salaries and, 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 and the creativity. So I want you to think about that because we're going to hear from our experts as to how, how one, you can work on your own brand but also about employment branding. So I want to introduce my guests. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Melanie Spring. I've known Melanie for almost 10 years, and uh, I've been trying to get her on the show since we started. Uh, one thing I can say is that when she walks into a room, she lights it up, and I'm not the only one who feels that way. She'll make you want to be her best friend. I think that's accurate. Yes, Melanie? Thanks. I think so. Yet, when she gets to know you enough enough of your story about what you're really up to, she is going to push you to uh, be better and be more excellent. She got out of her own box when she went on a 7,000-mile road trip collecting stories on how companies live their brand. Melanie, welcome to the show. Thank you. And Melanie's Twitter handle is at Melanie Spring. Also with me today uh, is Phil Strazula. Phil, did I get that right? You sure did. Do I need to put a little more accent on it, or is, did I say Strazula? <laughs> if you want to, feel free. I could put my Brooklyn, like, Strazula, Strazula. <laughs> He's the CEO of Next Wave Hire. Next Wave's software captures employee stories that enhance your career site, build talent communities, and spread the word on social media. Phil is a business nerd and started trading stocks when he was 11. 11, can you trade stocks when you're 11? Yeah, you just need your parents to drive you to Fidelity open up the account. <laughs> awesome. And uh, he is a self-taught programmer and a graduate of Harvard Business School and a former venture investor at Bessemer Venture Partners. Phil, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, you know, branding is so important. I think, I think there's been a huge shift in branding as far as how we as individuals think of it. I mean, when we were born, there were brands. Coca-Cola was a brand. Nike was a brand. Uh, IBM was a brand. And, and with them kind of came a, a meme, a story behind when you say the word brand. Um, and now because of technology, social media, individuals kind of working on their own, people are more interested in brand, but also brand can change so quickly and it can be shifted and, and infused with more color and more brightness. Um, so, so let me ask you, Melanie, why do you believe it's more important than ever to have a strong talent brand. For the business or yeah. your own talents? Well, I think, you know, we can just say both. I mean, we can focus on, on either as the conversation goes on, but why is it important? What, what's so important about talent, about brand? Well, brand is your attractor. So it's the thing that gets people to show up for you. It get, gets people to talk about you. But being really clear on what your brand is is important so that you get people to talk about you the way you want them to instead of just the way that they feel like they want to. Like you mentioned Uber. I might not want to work for Uber because the CEO is this guy who did horrible things. Well, but he changed the brand. He, figured, he, he updated his own brand, which updated the brand of the business. So that changes our view and it changes the way we talk about it, depending on how we feel about that person or the company. So the attractor, it's the feeling behind the whole thing. It's understanding what the feeling is and what we want people to feel about the brand, personally or for the business. Cool. And we're going to talk about the kind of feelings that, that people look for, mm -hmm. right? Because depending on what it is, I imagine the brand of like wrestling, you know, might be different than the brand for my, my toothpaste. Right. So, and Phil, why do you think branding is important today? I know this is really a focus for you around the employment side. Yeah, so I agree with Melanie. I think it's it's the attractor. Um, I think that 
we live in a country that has an unemployment rate hovering around 4%. And for some states, it's 2%. And some industries, it's essentially negative, right? Like there's there's not enough people to go around. Um, so I think it's important for businesses because in order to compete, you need to have a strong employer brand in order to compete for that talent. And as we know and, and believe, talent is one of the big drivers in, in being successful as a company itself. And so I think that it's just become more and more fundamental as kind of the, the war for talent heats up and as the way that we kind of uh, research things as consumers, um, meaning, you know, if I'm going to buy a new TV, I'm going to go check it out, I'm going to do some research online, et cetera. That sort of behavior is led over to how we do research uh, as job seekers. And so the, the few companies that have kind of gotten this right from the get-go, like your Googles of the world, are reaping huge benefits. And the other companies that are competing for that talent need to kind of step up their game in order to, to win. Yeah, one of the things that's recently occurred, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said uh, 18 months ago, so this is 2017, so sometime in 2015, that for the first time in their tracking of this data, there are now more jobs than there are people that can work. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, even though we have you know five or six million people unemployed, five or six million jobs, that's another problem that we're going to talk about in our, our, our other shows about the skills gap. But but the problem is that I don't know if I want to work for you because I don't identify with your brand. Right. So what is it archetypical like uh, like you know what's the the thing I'm looking for when I say brand? How do I identify? What, what do I look inside myself to say that's an attractive brand? And how does that line up? I mean, either of you can answer the question. I'm just interested in kind of the, the fundamentals of what we think of when, we, when we're when we trying to suss out brand. Yeah, well, I think that a lot of times people think um, this is kind of like a millennial thing um, that, you know, every, every millennial is out there looking for meaning and for ping pong tables or something like that. Um, and, and I think that this is actually like a thing that is important to um, my uncle who's 60, you know, when he looks for another job. And I think that it, it varies from person to person. In some cases, you might be more full, uh, family oriented and, and want to make sure that you are able to get home in time. Um, and somebody else might be super focused on diversity inclusion initiatives. And that's kind of like the thing that's going to make or break it for them. Um, but I think from the job seekers perspective, you kind of know it when you see it. And that means that the onus is on companies to show it so that job seekers can actually um, take in the right information, understand what your employee value propositions are, what your employer brand is, and then they can make a decision, an informed decision about, is this right for me or wrong for me? So, uh, Melanie, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. The, there's a lot of companies that I work with that are 30 to 40 years old that have been stuck in their ways for a really long time. And they're still thinking, oh, well, we need to hire really amazing people, but they haven't ever updated their own brand to be able to attract those people. They're still stuck in the same hiring processes right. and the same office spaces. And people aren't happy, but they're still chugging along. They're like, well, obviously, we know what we're doing because we have all these great people. But most of those people are looking for something better. They just haven't found the better thing yet. And updating those hiring processes, updating their offices, updating their, pra- their just their general practices on how they do what they do to be able to take an introspective look as a company at what you're doing and be able to figure out what is the thing that makes us tick and make us so much better than anyone else in this thing that we do. Instead of looking at the other companies doing the exact same thing, look at other industries and say, okay, how can we really update it? Like, are we like the hotel industry? Which kind of a hotel would we align with if we were like that? How have they done it? And how can we do that so that we can start attracting people like that? And being able to really understand that it isn't just about those millennials, as you were talking about, how it is my like my dad. He's 58 years old and he really has a brand. But certain people will want to hire him and other people won't because it's who he is. And those things have to match up. It's like dating. You're like, okay, here's the things I can offer and here's the things you have. And how can we mash those up together and make sure that we're actually on the same page with them? Not everyone is your perfect fit and vice versa. Not everyone fits your company. So how can you make sure that those two things are there? But a lot of people put the onus on the 
employees, not necessarily the company. So sure. they're like, well, you guys need to have better skills and you guys need to do better as, at, at your resumes and you guys need to do better at blah, blah, blah. When in reality, the companies aren't doing anything to help get them to be the right fit because they could be. But who knows? Because they'll never find out. Yeah, I think that's that's accurate. I, I noticed that for me, when I'm attracted to a brand, it's something that I want to be a reflection of either who I am or who I aspire to be. Right. So, um, you know, I didn't go to Harvard, but I imagine, you know, but I went to college. And, and in going to college, I wanted my college to somehow reflect my tastes and my abilities and, you know, what I, how I see the world. Right. Um, the magazines that I read um, are also that. You know, I subscribe to like Yes Magazine and Technology Review. I mean, they're they're both kind of in a line with how I am or how I want to be. And when I think of companies, it's very true. I mean, I don't find a lot of companies that really reflect my values. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a very specific set of values. And I would like there to be something there that I can grab onto. It doesn't have to be everything, right? It could be a company that just does baked goods. But if they have a social mission, if they're a co-op, or if they they do something that's that want, that makes the world a better place, then I feel like I will have that piece nurtured. Right. And in a way, I'm willing to compromise because you know I know I'm not going to find everything in the company I look for, although I'm sure it's out there. Um, so if companies, organizations see themselves as a reflection of what their employees are thinking, and and what we kind of touched on is that this is so important now. Because there's Glassdoor, there's, you know, everything's getting rated and scaled and there's no way to hide your brand. Right. You can't, you can't be IBM, which had that brand now and not expect the whole world to know the true story. Right. Right. What do you think about that, Phil? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, employer branding, especially, you know, you're, you have an opportunity to sort of write your own story and define your own brand or you can let the world kind of write it for you. Um, and, and I think sites like Glassdoor are um, super useful for candidates, but it's funny. I, I was reading a message board called Hacker News um, a week or two ago, and somebody had posted, what do you guys think about um, Glassdoor reviews? And about 60 or 70 software engineers chimed in. And the vast majority, I would say 90% of people said they're, they're super biased, right? Like you're either getting somebody who got fired or potentially you're getting like the CEO or the HR person <laughs> to write something overly right. fluffy. Um, and yeah, I, I think that we live in a world where you've got to kind of take the rein. Um, but I think like a, a point that Melanie brought up, which is really um, astute is it's not just about attraction. It's also about retention. Um, and so you have to be authentic in the, the brand that you create. Otherwise, you're just going to have a massive retention issue. Um, and I think that that's why whenever I think about employer branding, it's always kind of a two-part definition. It's what do people think it's like to work at your company? And then what's it actually like <laughs> to work at your company? And hopefully they're pretty aligned because um, if not, you're going to run into a whole another host of issues. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and we come back. We're going to talk about how to figure out what your brand is. So, um I'm Lauren Epstein. You're listening to The Lauren Epstein Show here on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, my name's Lauren Epstein, and every week at 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock on Mondays, I talk about jobs and careers and the workplace. We've done shows on pot in the workplace, the salary secrecy laws, and how to write a resume. I'm inviting you to come on our show. If you're interested or have show ideas, you can give me a call at 240-876-0276 or email me at lauren at electriccow.com or you can go to our webpage at laurenepstein.com or our Facebook page, which is also Lauren Epstein and our Mixcloud account is, and you guessed it, Lauren Epstein at mixcloud.com. Hope to see you here on the show soon. Welcome back to The Lauren Epstein Show. I'm Lauren Epstein. You're listening to 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. And we're talking about branding. Um, I've got my experts here, Melanie Spring and um, Phil Strazula. Um, how does someone know what their brand is? Uh, Melanie, what, what, like, what do I know? Like, I, I'm, I run a company, and uh, it's a telecom company, and, you know, 
I don't know what my brand is. So most companies don't actually know what their brand is. And a lot of companies, like I said, my sweet spot is 30 to 40 year old companies because most of them started with this great mission to like change the world doing this manufacturing thing, whatever the thing is that they're doing. And after a while, they start losing that original reason why they started. So the purpose is kind of where the beginning of the brand starts, and it's the foundational piece for the whole entire brand. So what's the purpose of the company? But then understanding what are the actual core values to how you run every single thing in your business, not just how do you work as a team, but how do you work as a team? How does your company make decisions overall? And how do you work with your clients or customers? So the core values have to fit all three of those things. And once you understand what those are, then you take that into how do we explain to the outside world what we actually are? So that's great. Let's break that down. So the first thing is purpose. (laughs) What is purpose? Purpose. It's the reason for being. So what is the reason for your company being the thing that it is? And what would be an example? Oh, goodness. So many examples. So it would be like, who are we helping? How are we helping them? And why are we helping them? That's your purpose. So an example would be that I like my purpose is to help other people tell their story in a way that helps them help the world. So in other words, I'm helping people from a branding perspective. I'm a brand strategist, but I also help people with the confidence that they need to tell the story that they already have inside of them so that they can make an impact on other people to do a thing that they're meant to do. So I'm helping other people with their purpose, which is kind of like a big circle. (laughs) (laughs) My purpose is to help your purpose is to help my purpose. Right, exactly. So (laughs) if you are there doing your purposeful thing, I'm doing my purposeful thing. Right. And Phil, what do you think about that? What's your sense of purpose? Uh, Me personally? Yeah, like, well, you know, yes. What's your purpose? Um, I, I think it's something that it, it's almost an intimidating question, especially since I think it evolves so much over time, you know, and even like our company, like we've, we've talked about this, like, what is our brand? What, like, what are, what's our mission? And I think what we've kind of come across through many hundreds of interactions and kind of like discovering this through what other people say about us, um, is, you know, empowering HR to kind of, um, do more. Um, and, and, you know, from my personal perspective, I, I think my purpose is to create companies that will have an impact that I can feel good about. Well, and in this in the same vein, a lot of companies, a lot of people don't know what their brand is or their purpose is or what that specific thing is. And that's not a bad thing. Most people will probably never figure that out, which is kind of why I'm so passionate about this thing. But it usually comes from what am I really good at? personally, what am I really like genetically engineered to do? What do I love to do? What is the thing that the world needs for me? And how can I make money doing it? And if you can do that in the center of all four of those things, that is your purpose, which is this tiny little itty bitty teensy little thing that like you said, would evolve over time. It doesn't necessarily the thing that I was doing when I was 20 is not the calling that I have when I'm 50. But it's being able to understand who you are as you're still growing in that brand, because your jobs will change. Like I started I have an organizational communications degree. I'm one of the only people I know who does the thing that I went to college for. (laughs) But I also knew my purpose way earlier than most people do, which is probably why I'm doing the thing that I'm doing now. So helping people understand who they are and how to stand up. Like my company's new name is Branded Confidence because I help people find their confidence in their company or in themselves to be able to tell that story. So, I mean, I just worked with five guys recently. They had the no, hamburger place. The hamburger place. They got number one this last year after we updated their whole entire brand messaging and positioning and who they are, what their purpose was. And it went all the way back to the very beginning of what they did. They had changed so much over the years because of the fact that they kept growing and changing and their people were changing. But it was still the five brothers and the two parents. And at the end of the day, we figured out that their whole purpose for being was to be real. But none of their messaging was saying that. And they couldn't tell anybody about that. And they worried. They're like, well, people should just say stuff about us. And I'm like, yeah, but you kind of want to be able to tell them a little bit about what they could be saying. So if they could define that, we rewrote their whole brand book to help them understand this is how we talk about it. So it became a part of their onboarding process. So when they hired people, they hired people who did speak real, who said real things, who were authentic in who they were as human beings, so that you had a smiling face when you walked into the store every time. You had a smiling face every time you talked to someone on the phone, you made sure that you had a positive interaction the whole time because they knew if you hire real people, you don't train people to be nice. (laughs) You can train skills. I can train someone to flip burgers, but I can't train someone to be nice. So how do I find people who already have that authentic, real personality that I can make sure I'm hiring? Now, a lot of uh, folks, now I don't don't know the five guys folks, but I imagine they're kind of nice. They're real. They're just normal, everyday humans. 
Right. And so that it's easy for them to say, well, this is what our brand is because that's who they are. Right. You can't change who you are. Right. And I've seen a lot of companies where the CEO, the executive, you know, the executive leadership is kind of like, we want to hire nice people, but they're not nice. Or they, they want to hire people who are whatever, but that's not who they are. Isn't that the law of attraction? Yeah. <laughs> Right. So what do we do about that, Phil? I mean, what do we do when a company's leadership is not in alignment with their brand? This is the hard question. I think you've been asking hard questions. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) I mean, I I guess I would actually, you know, argue that it's not in in line with the brand they're trying to build, but the brand that they have, it it, it just is what it is. Um, Like it's the, it's how people think about working there. It's how people think about the management team. Um, and all that other stuff. If you have an aspirational brand that doesn't align with like what the reality actually is, then I think you have a large problem. And basically, like that is something that um, it, it's almost like a, a, a different type of problem. It's not about evangelizing um, something different. It's about fixing the foundation that allows you to have a strong, true, authentic brand. And you know, if, if that's the case, then it's more about like leadership training and changing culture than it is about telling the story in a different way. Yeah, Phil, I did a workshop the other day that was basically I started with, hi, guys, you guys are the marketing department. You're the brand ambassadors and you're building brand ambassadors. And I said, and today, if anyone feels like at the end of this, they're, they're, they don't feel like they fit, you can totally quit. And they were yeah. literally like, um, so when Melanie said that at the beginning of the workshop, it kind of put like a little cloud over the over the atmosphere around here. And I was like, yeah, did you did the guy who probably should quit say that? And she goes, yes. And I was like, well, weird. Weird that would happen. <laughs> He's like, I just didn't feel like I could say the things I wanted to say. And I was like, yeah, because you should probably quit. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was um, the hedgehog principle. I, I forget. It was good to great where they mm-hmm. talked about getting people off the bus. Yeah. I think that's always the case in but in corporate and, america that's yeah. so hard to shake up like yeah. it was a big association and they were like well you just got to be careful how you say so i'm like no you shouldn't be careful about saying stuff like that yeah right being real yeah yeah because i mean there's so much on the line yeah right i mean that to, to wake people up is about saying hey look you could have these people in the company but you're not going to go great you're and not, I'm not get saying better. hey someone today is getting fired you're getting voted off the island or anything it's right. just more if you don't feel like you're a good fit please do quit and go find the thing you're supposed to do yeah or get another job in the company right okay cool well we, we've got some of the the bigger things we will <laughs> should we go lighter nah nah so what's the role of employees in sharing the brand like if I work for some company, what what's my responsibility, my accountability for the brand? So I, I would say <laughs> she's that, pointing to um, you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think that um, you know the employees in many ways are the brand, um, and that's getting back to like the earlier conversation around like how do you discover it? It's basically by asking people like, why do you work here? <laughs> you know, like. Mm. Like what? What are what are what are the feelings that you get um, when you think about this company, et cetera, et cetera? And I think that you know there are certainly employees who are just introverted, or you know they, they don't want to have an online presence for one reason or another. Um, but your employees are a hundred percent the best channel for you to communicate your brand, both from like a content perspective and, and having them create stories, but then also as a distribution mechanism. And help having them, you know, share the information, whether that's over a drink with a friend or at, you know, a campus recruiting event or on social media, et cetera. And the, the really cool thing is that, you know, getting back to this, like, good to great, like, strategy, business strategy stuff, if you've got a great culture and your employees are the foundation of that and they're helping you evangelize it, they're going to help you get even more amazing employees which are going to contribute again to that amazing culture with rinse, wash, repeat. The, the cycle continues. Um, so I think that the employees are, are huge. Well, and they're the brand ambassadors. So they're the front line. And I was talking to marketing the other day about this at a big company. And it was like, so you guys might be the original brand ambassadors, but you're building brand ambassadorship in every other department and every interaction. So you guys aren't the bad guys. You're the good guys who want to help them become brand ambassadors. 
So I worked with a credit union not too long ago, and they had this, I mean, you know the financial industry and how much has changed and how much it used to be. Don't even tell people where you work. Because if you tell people and they find out, you're going to get in trouble and the lawyers will be on us and blah, 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 blah. Well, they've changed that so much that credit unions are allowed to let their employees talk about the fact that they have a job at a credit union (laughs) and that they can do this. So they took their social media policy and they were like, most of it was don't do this, never do this, don't even say this, it's not possible, just stay off of all of the social media, don't even tell people where you work definitely don't sell anything. Like it was basically making their jobs harder. So they updated the whole thing. We re- rewrote an entire social media policy. It was like, here's how to use Twitter. Here's how to use social media. Don't forget to add us to your, this is where I work. Make sure that when you share it, here's some great language you can use. And here's some stuff. And here's this little bitty, don't do these things. But it was so tiny and so insignificant that it helped them actually give them the voice to be able to talk about the brand to everyone they knew because their employees are the reason that they actually keep growing. So instead of having to hire more salespeople who can go out and like make phone calls, they could actually just have someone go, hey, I'm looking for a great loan officer. Oh, we have a great one at our credit union. You should call them. Great. You have language for that. So it gives them the ability to create the brand ambassadorship inside the company because they're your biggest voice. And if they're not talking about you the right way, you definitely have a problem. So like Phil was just saying, take a survey. Most people don't want to know at all. <laughs> they don't want to know what their employees think of them. But to, like, give them honest questions. Like on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you like working here? And make it anonymous so that they don't have like, okay, they could fire me for saying this. Like really get real answers from your employees to make sure that they actually are telling you the stuff that you really should know. Or like, what are things we could fix if you were the boss? What would you do differently? You don't have to take their advice on everything, but it's a good way to get really good feedback to how you can change things. Yeah, and to bracket that, a couple things. I think for the listener, we're not talking about amazing Facebook or rich big companies. We're talking about regular companies here that are just trying to do their thing. Right, right? even if you have two employees, it doesn't matter. Ask them what they think of you. Right, and I think you have a couple of employees, Mm -hmm. and you have a very strong brand. Very. Like People line up to come work for me. Yeah. Which is hard because I don't want anyone to work for me. <laughs> I'm like, no, I keep firing people. I, like, As in like getting rid of my team, not just firing them because they're not good. But like, I don't want to build a team. And now I keep building it. So now I have two employees again. <laughs> I'm like, where, how do I keep doing this? <laughs> so uh, there's a, 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 a place called Sugar Shack here in Arlington. Mm-hmm. And I've had the owner here on the show. And part of his brand is that all the people that work there were convicted felons. Which is an amazing thing, yeah. right? So it's not like they have, and they do have like cartoonishly amazing looking donuts, but they have this culture which is much more meaningful. And I think the thing we kind of touched on a bit is that in part, brand can have a lot of meaning for people. Like it could be really deep and emotional and uh, something that they felt feel really strong about. Strong about. When we were talking earlier about the problems with a uh, oh, different show, Macintosh computers. My wife's having a problem with her Mac computer. So I went online and I was listening to other folks talk about Macintosh. And they You're bought these Apple, new- you mean? Apple, excuse me. Apple. <laughs> I just dated myself. Wow, you Apple really computers. <laughs> Plus, I don't own any, right? So my wife has an Apple computer and she wanted to get another Apple computer having all these problems. We looked online and there are people there who spent hours and hours and hours explaining how much they love the brand but they hate this com- computer because Apple is falling apart. Mm-hmm. So you have these people who are brand ambassadors and telling Apple, hey, stop, you got to make these better. You got to, and I don't know if they're listening because <laughs> clearly something's going on with their, their hardware. It's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's not as clean or crisp or however it should be. And I can tell you because my wife just bought an Apple computer and we returned it because it was not living up to the name. So, when you're, if you own a company, if you work at a company, you really got to be listening. I think that's one of the things you're saying is you got to be listening to what people are really saying and not dismissive. You know, if, if one person says you're an ass, you know, dismiss it. But if 10 people do, get a saddle, right? right? Um, and I, I'd like to hear from Phil, like, how do we, you know, what do we do to move the brand forward? How do we, how do we get this thing going? Like, okay, now I know this is what people think. Now what do I do? Yeah. So I, I think there's, there's basically like two outcomes from having a deeper understanding of where the brand is. And one is, oh, this is awesome. You know, we have all these amazing value propositions. Let's evangelize them. And, you know, a great way to do that is for employees and social media and, and all this stuff that we've kind of touched on a little bit. Um, and then the other scenario is, huh, you know, we actually have a lot of work to do. <laughs> you know, like, 
we um this isn't this isn't where we want to be and we've kind of been deluding ourselves this entire time <laughs> and we you know we we tell ourselves that those ratings on Glassdoor mean nothing and you know everything's all all great um and i think that if you, if you wind up in that second camp a lot of times before you start evangelizing you you need to come up with an, a plan to fix the culture and think about you know where do we want to be why are we here what is our purpose how do we want people to feel when they come to work and then as as part of that i think um you know that's kind of like the the second part of employer branding like what's it like to work your company and then the first part around like evangelizing the the mission you know after you kind of lay the, the groundwork uh i think that you can go out and you can have an employer brand that is um, a little bit aspirational because that's going to allow you to attract the people who are going to help you continue to push the culture forward. Because realistically, if, if you've got a, a older company that doesn't have the culture that you want, it's probably not going to change just with those people who are in the office today and the people who you've been attracting for the last you know, couple of decades. You need to kind of mix it up. And the way to do that is to communicate differently. Yeah, Melanie, um, shaking your head. Yes. Let's take a quick break, and then we'll be right back. I want to talk more about how we do the first part that you said, Phil. Uh, I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. You're listening to The Lauren Epstein Show here on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, I'm Lauren Epstein. Every week, I talk about jobs and careers on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia, at 10 a.m. Mondays. Welcome back. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. You're listening to The Lauren Epstein Show here on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia. And we're just about to hear from Phil. How do you create your plan? Like, what do you do? What are the pieces of that? And, and then we'll hear from Melanie as well. Yeah, so this is a place that's slightly beyond my, my core expertise. But I think that the um, sort of like the understanding initially is really important. And then on an ongoing basis, there are all these wonderful tools that you can um, collect information of are called pulse surveys to understand on a weekly basis how your culture is changing and evolving. And realistically, you're, you're probably going to need some outside help in understanding where you want the culture to be and, and how to get there. And it's going to be a really, it's, it's not like a, a silver bullet type of thing. It's one of these things where it's a lot of hard work. It's probably going to take a really long time. Um, and uh, you just got to keep working at it. So I want to hear from you, Melanie, but I want to give a little story. My wife, who does work around culture, worked with a, a gym, a bunch of gyms, but a gym in Massachusetts. And after about a year of working, you know, it wasn't like she was there every day, but a year of workshops and surveys and all sorts of activities, they increased their revenue by 10%. So there is a benefit to this. So, Melanie, before we get to the good juicy part, what are some of the ways to think of like a plan? How do you figure out what's the process? So one of the big things I talk about is how to rock your humans. And it's basically how to understand your culture, how to understand what they think of you and how to stop trying to be something you're not. Because a lot of companies are aspirationally being something that they're not. And yes, you should definitely have an aspirational brand. You should definitely be growing. It's like being a human and saying, I'm just going to stay the same way for the rest of my life. That doesn't work. But if you can do that aspirational branding and understand how do we really want to be and start attracting those people, it automatically starts growing. I don't think it takes a terribly long time to do that. It's just making sure that you have the right focus and you have the right the right direction, like which end of the tunnel we're going toward. Are we going toward the light or are we going to the dark? So like, how can we make sure that we're really focused on that? But then understanding your hiring process. So most people are having a hard time, not just from a branding perspective, but they're still using the same process they used in 1952 of, okay, we're going to put out this horrible job posting and then we're going to get horrible resumes in return and we're going to review all of them and hope we can figure out how to find the right person. And then we're going to bring people in for these horrible interviews and then bring them in for a horrible second interviews. And we're <laughs> going to ask them all sorts of random questions that right. they probably already know the answers to. And they're just going to give us these horrible answers and then we're going to hope that it all works out. It's like getting married to someone before you really know them. You right. saw them on paper and you're like, oh, yeah, you should be a great fit for us. So updating your hiring process, and I like to take people through like a totally crazy part, which I do the crazy way of doing things because I can do whatever I want to. But 
I tell people there's a happy medium between what the, it is now and what I'm doing. So figure out like how can you make sure your hiring process is not so freaking boring. And if you're a boring company, have a boring, boring, boring hiring process. But if you can find a way to flip the script and say, this is how amazing we are and this is what we're looking for instead of a tiny little like, we're this amazing company in two sentences and here's everything we're looking for. You're really not hiring for skills. You're hiring for like personality. So if you can find the right people, you can make sure that they fit in the right places. So it's making sure that you can understand how to quit going through just tons of resumes. Because, like, moms are some of the best people I've ever hired. They don't have a resume that would ever fit a job description I would write. But if I can say, I'm looking for these kinds of people who have this kind of stuff that they've done. Can you tell me what you've done before that fits the things that I'm looking for? And they can actually answer those questions instead of hoping I can figure out and draw the lines between the two. So really, I mean, I have a whole long thing on that. But being able to really understand what you're trying to look for and how to attract those people, that's why people come to me and they – create videos. People spend like four weeks creating videos to apply for a job that I posted because they really want to work for me and they want to show me that they're really putting in the effort to do that. I've had some of my best hires from stuff like that. So tell me about your hiring process. What oh, can I what can I learn from it? The the basics of it are that we post a job posting that really stands out. Like one of our latest ones is part-time kick-ass human looking or um, I think it was like part-time kick-ass human wanted for a big company. That was the job title, which mostly most people put administrative assistant needed. <laughs> so <laughs> that really gets attracted. Like people are attracted to that title. Then we talk a lot about who we are. We put pictures of Griffin in there. We put pictures of the office. Griffin is your dog. My Griffin's my dog. And we put pictures of the office. We show the environment. We put links in there so they can go see stuff. And we say, here's all the awesome stuff about us. We really love these things, but we're really picky about these things. We want to make sure that this is a good fit for you. Then here are the things we're looking for. And if you're interested in being hired, by us, do not send us your resume or we'll snicker behind your back. So you have to fill out these four application questions and you can fill them out however you want to. You can send me a a Word document with four answers on it. You can send me a video. You can send me an auto recording. You can send me a PowerPoint presentation. Someone sent me an actual scrapbook of all of the four questions <laughs> answered. So I have some really Did random you hire stuff. Them? No, that not yeah. that person. But there are somebody some people have sent me really interesting like cartoon videos of them. Mm. I hired that person. So um, they answer four questions which are how do you fit the job? How do you fit the company? What do you bring to the office vibe? And what's your superpower? I like that. But I recently had someone actually write at the end what's your superpower and it said avoiding horrible questions. And I was like, mm, uh-huh. I don't think I'm going to hire you. So thanks. So basically, I was trying to um, trying to figure out how can I get people to apply, which basically means they can read and they can follow directions. First two w- rules of working for me, you have to be able to do both of those things. Right. So the second part of it is that when we walk them through the hiring process, I have my team actually do the first interviews. So they anyone who sends a resume automatically disqualified, like you can't even apply. And then after we go through the applications, which gets rid of a lot, out of 60 resumes, we only had 15 applications. So it was great. I only had to look through 15 things instead of 60 of them. So then we go through a hiring process of like, if I asked you, can you process map? You'd probably be like, sure. And then you Google it later and be like, what's a process map? (laughs) But if I asked you, can you show me how to teach another person how to chew a piece of gum? I can actually hear you talk through a process map. You would tell them to open the stick of gum in a certain way, and you would tell them how to put it in their mouth and how to start chewing it, how to spit it out, how to put it like in another place, that kind of a thing. So it depends on how detailed you are, because I want to make sure someone's really detailed. I want to make sure that they can do it instead of, yes, I can process map. And then the final the final interview, we actually go through a whole walking interview, because I can't sit still for very long. Yeah. So I walk them to the Capitol and ask them three simple questions. And the yeah. very first question, I won't tell you all of them, but the very first question is, today is the day you quit. You've been working for me for a while, and you've done lots of stuff for me, but I want you to tell me why you're quitting, and how long you've been with me, and what you learned, and where you're going next. And I had someone actually say, so I've decided to go on the mission to Mars. (laughs) And I was like, seriously? And she's like, everything I've learned here is amazing. Like, I can teach people how to, I can do the marketing for it. I can actually do a whole bunch of social media stuff. I have all this this great experience from you. And now I'm able to take that so that we can reflect that back to Earth. And I was like, all right, (laughs) you're done. (laughs) This is amazing. But what happens is I take them to the Capitol building and make them do a selfie with me. Guess what happens when people do selfies? You become like their BFF for some reason, and then they tell you everything. So then you say, hey, so tell me more about you. Literally anything that you want to know, they'll tell you. 
And you don't have to ask them anything because you're not asking them anything that you shouldn't ask them. You're just saying, tell me more about you. And they'll tell you stuff that you're like, well, I don't think I wanted to know that. (laughs) (laughs) But by the end of it, you know these people well enough to go, I can make a decision on whether I want to spend a lot more time with you or not. So that's that's how we do our hiring process. That's great. I mean, I actually have been doing some of these things that you're talking about for for a long time. Mm-hmm. So instead of uh, looking at resumes, I create a, a questionnaire. Mm-hmm. So with eight or nine or ten questions, particularly technical questions, and I want them to fill that out, and I want them to kind of tell me how they think because I'm really more interested in how they what their thought process is and how they learn and what they're strong at versus whatever they've done in the past. Right. Because I know everything they've done in the past marginally relevant, right? Right. It's marginally relevant because they're working in a different place, doing something completely different. And I, I, I interviewed uh, last year, and one of the questions I got was, uh, what would your enemy say about you? Ooh. And I thought, uh, I, I think, I can't remember having an enemy since I was like in high school. <laughs> Mine would just say <laughs> but, that I'm too intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had some really weird questions. Yeah. Like questions that aren't like, you know, uh, that are unscripted, but not helpful. Your greatest weakness, which yeah. is like, I work too hard. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, okay. That's Everyone st- knows the answer to that. <laughs> exactly. Your greatest weakness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, Phil, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's amazing. And it reflects a lot of like our philosophy on these sorts of things. Um, I was just actually reflecting on um, when I worked in a more corporate uh, job and had, you know, bosses and things like that. And we actually wrote a, an incredibly creative job description um, for uh, to, to hire somebody. And um, I remember feeling super intimidated um, because I, I think if something's been done that way for a really long time, it, it's hard to break the mold. And it's cool to like hear people um, doing stuff in like a startup environment or whatever but if you work in like a financial institution like I did um, you almost wonder if you're going to get like fired or something <laughs> like writing mm. something that's not you know a couple of bullet points that you uh, found off a of Google search but I guess uh, I, I only bring it up to like give people the courage to actually go and do that and, and try something creative because we got amazing applicants and people we're talking about that job description in the interview. Um, and we got, you know, we were recruiting from like really, really top tier schools and uh, competing against, you know, the best companies in the world. And, you know, we just got phenomenal results. And I think in large part because we had that more interesting um, application an application process. So one of the things I, I'm a big proponent of is people doing the thing that they're going to be doing with you. So I mm. consulted with a friend of mine who has a big data company and he would go to the big schools to hire people and they would sit him and someone else and interview these PhDs from top schools. And I said, well, why don't you bring your team and have the candidate walk in and solve a problem together, you know, work for an hour and see how that goes. And they had much better results. I did this when I hired and built a team of recruiters in India. I got my, you know, I, I talked to like 120 people and then I invited my top 13 or 14 folks to one of the cities on a Saturday. And we took them through a whole day of actually doing the job. The first thing I had them do was pair off and introduce each other to themselves. And then I had one person each, everyone stood up and introduced the person they just spoke to, to everyone. So there I could see how well they listened, how well they spoke and how highly they spoke with the person who they were just talking to. Then I had them write job descriptions. Then I had them get on the internet and start doing recruiting. And we wish, you know, me and the other vice presidents went around and watched them on the phone, you know, recruiting with somebody else. And, and we hired a great team. And, you know, it was fun for them. All the candidates were like, that was the job interview. Like, even if they didn't get the job, they had a great time. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is really like if you're going to take someone's time, make it fun. Well, like the walking interview, the reason I do a walking interview, not just because I can't sit still, is because I want someone to be able to walk with me. Yeah. And I don't walk as fast as I normally walk on that, but I have, some people have walked behind me. Yeah. Some people have walked in front of me and very few have walked next to me. Yeah. And that's a big deal to me as I'm not a boss. I'm not someone who's going to be walking out in front of them all the time. Right. But I want someone who can handle going with me and doing things, not necessarily just following behind me or leading me as they're going so it's a like those little tiny things like even crossing the street at the not a crosswalk 
that's a big deal to me. I want to be able to just walk across the street. And if they're like really big rule followers, they're going to hate working for me when it comes to a lot of things. Yeah. So it's those little tiny nuances. Yeah. And also, if you're a social media manager and you don't get the stinking capital in the picture, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> like mm-hmm. we're taking a picture with the capital and most people wouldn't get the capital in the picture. And I'm like, no, but that's like the thing. Like, that's what we're doing here. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that? Right. So. I did that once with a candidate in, in uh, an executive candidate in India. I had him take me for. I like walking. I mm-hmm. like walking because I can walk and talk much better than I can just sit here. Oh yeah. So we walked, and one of the things he did was he. I closed my eyes, and he guided me around. Mm. I had him guide me around, and it was like an incredible experience. I thought he was great, but I took so much stuff from my colleagues about sharing that story for like ever. Mm-hmm. They just made fun of it because they thought it was too wooey wooey or too out there and they didn't get it. Right. And and that I think is the problem for a lot of things that we're talking about is that people just don't get what it is to be a human that it's okay to be a human at work. Right. You know, because uh-huh. you are. So let's talk. I mean, we've got a few more minutes to go. Uh, what do you think, what else do people think you think people need to know to to get to that last mile of having a, a good brand? How do you communicate this brand that they've now invented for themselves? I personally think that uh, specifically for for organizations, for companies who are trying to use their brand to attract talent, I think that the main analog I like to draw on is marketing. Um, I, I think that the way that people search for jobs, research jobs, discover jobs is very similar to the way that they do the same for products. And the companies that have kind of figured that out and are more aggressive on social that are using marketing technology, essentially, and marketing best practices are the ones that are winning in the war for talent. And there are, com- there are some companies like Google that figured this out a really long time ago. And then I think there's, there's another wave of companies that are doing the same. And so I always um, rely on that analog. And it's not 100% perfect, but it's really, really close. Um, and so that's always kind of my advice as just a guiding principle when thinking about this sort of stuff. So, Melanie, what do you think is the most effective way in spreading the word about a company's brand? When it comes to hiring? Well, I mean, yeah, sure, hiring or brand in general, because it's kind of the same, right? Yeah, well, it's the team. I mean, it's the people in the company that are the most effective to spread the word about the brand. So if if the people in the company aren't wearing the T-shirt, they should be fired. Like if you can't wear the T-shirt, if you can't do the thing that you are, right. you're talking about, you're marketing, you're telling other people about, that's the first big problem. So I wanted to say something before you go on. Mm-hmm. So uh, Melanie is wearing a uh, Marmot vest mm-hmm. that has Maverick on it. She's She's got a... a a tin of water that says Maverick on it, and her T-shirt says Wonderlust, mm-hmm. which totally captures her because she is constantly on the road. <laughs> so you are wearing, I don't know if you know that consciously, but you're wearing your brand. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about, right? Right, yeah. At some level, do people know what's going on just by talking to you or looking at you? Well, like, my personal brand is Approachable Badass. Like, that's the whole point to what my personal brand is. And my company's brand, my company used to be Cicerina, and we were an eight-year-old marketing company that did... Lots and lots of things within the branding sphere. And I decided to move into doing just branded confidence by Melanie Spring, which is just me. You're hiring me. I have a team behind me to help me, but you're really hiring me at the end of the day. So I had to show up fully in my approachable badass nature to be able to make sure that if I met someone at a grocery store and they happened to have seen me speak at some point, that they're like, oh, you're Melanie. I know you because I show up everywhere the same way. Like, And I might be in my yoga pants for all that matters coming from a yoga class, but I'm still showing up as me every single place that I go. But I'm not showing up in a way that like, if I'm complaining about something, you know that there's obviously something missing in my brand because I'm a very positive human being who's showing up per- as my personality, not just how I'm looking and how I'm dressing. But I have to think about all of the different parts of my life. How do they all mesh together? Because I'm selling me. And at the end of the day, the employees inside of a company, they're selling the company. So if on Twitter, there's a thing that say, my views do not represent my my company, that's bull****. <laughs> Just saying. Well, it is. But basically, they have to make sure that they can live the brand in every single aspect. Yeah. So it's like the Twitter employee that deleted Donald Trump's <laughs> Twitter account <laughs> for 11 minutes. Twitter did not sit there and go, we're going to call this guy out. Everyone's going to, we're going to smear his name. We're going to tell everybody because the company stood behind the person, even though it was his last day at that job, the the company stood behind that person because it was part of their brand. So it wasn't just a reflection on the person. It was a reflection on the whole brand and how they handled that was amazing. Like remember American Cross or American Red Cross? 
how somebody, somebody, the person that was doing social media accidentally tweeted from American Red Cross, Cross's Twitter account that they were going to get, I think they were getting dog fish head beer and they were getting slizzard. And then they deleted it, but everyone saw it before they deleted it. How they handled that yeah. was way bigger than what actually happened. So they never fired the person. They actually, the person kept doing it. They said, hey, everyone makes honest mistakes. So do we. Not a big deal. And everyone was like, whoa, that's amazing. Because other companies have fired employees for doing stuff like that. Right. So every single thing that happens, employees, company, everything is part of who they are as a core, what their purpose is and how they run as an organization. You have, you're, they're going to attract way more people by how they show up in the bigger sphere of the world. Yeah. So they have to know who they are and how they want to show up in order to make sure that they're attracting the right people. One of the first ways I saw that, that demonstrated that was when Johnson Johnson had the problem with... Uh, their Tylenol being tampered with. Mm. This is back in the 80s, and I was in mm. business school. And um, we examined it as a case because the company said, you know what, yes, we screwed up. We made a huge mistake, we're sorry, and here's what we're gonna do about it. Right. And they started with the whole tamper-resistant packaging, which wasn't on packages before then. Right. You can just open up a box of something and everything was kind of easily accessible. Right. And that changed, I think, uh, all of uh, over-the-counter prescriptions and, 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 and that kind of stuff. But it really demonstrated to folks that Johnson & Johnson cared about people. Right. It wasn't just, hey, we care. It wasn't a tagline or right. something. It was something that they were showing people. Right. And that's what I was meaning by. Yeah. When I show up, I'm showing up fully as myself. Yeah. Not just a little piece of myself. Right. Not like I put on this the same clothes every day. And how much more fun would that be if we all worked that way? If we all worked <gasps> as an expression of who we really were. I would be able to die a happy woman. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would join you. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Awesome. Phil. Any any parting words before that? And, and tell folks how they can reach out to you if they want. Yeah, sure. So I, I guess my only thought that I had as, as you guys were just talking about that last piece was I think there are a lot of people, and I'm in that group, who naturally are adverse to um, like sharing that, that sort of brand uh, about themselves or their companies or whatever. And I've worked for companies that were just terrible at building their brand. They were kind of like all stake um, type, of, type of companies. And I think that the reality is um, 100% what you guys were just saying. Like, this stuff is so important. And if you're, that's kind of like, if it's a little bit fighting your own natural inclinations, you should learn how to fight that um, and kind of and build it as a new skill set for yourself. So people can find me uh, on Twitter, at Bill Scrizula. Um, they can check out uh, our website, nextwavehire.com. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, hit me up on social media. Great. Thanks, Phil. And, and Melanie, how can people find you? In the grocery store? <laughs> in yoga pants? <laughs> Which grocery store? <laughs> Trader Joe's. They just put one in next to my office. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm super excited. Basically, I my biggest my biggest thing is that everyone should show up as who they are. And if you need to figure out who you are and what you stand for, I mean, most people have never figured that out. So don't feel bad if you haven't figured that out yet. Or if you don't understand what your brand is. I ask people on my podcast all the time. I'm like, so what's your brand? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, do you want to figure it out? Let's figure it out. And they're like, crap. <laughs> um, but figuring out who you are and what you do, that's literally what I help people do. So you can find me at brandedconfidence.com or melaniespring.com. And um, I'm on Twitter at Melanie Spring and all of those other awesome places. So Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Phil. You've been listening to another episode of The Lauren Epstein Show. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein, here on 96.7 FM. We'll see you next week, Monday at 10 a.m.